Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Eric Talavera, and I'm the executive director of EQUA, and I'll explain briefly what EQUA is uh, towards the end of the presentation. So first, I want to thank the organizers of Texuyo for the invitation, for the to the sponsors that make this, all, all, all this uh, possible, and explain why I think I'm here. Um, the reason I think I'm here is because I have the opportunity to share uh, with a lot of people that are linked to the education sector, and possibly all the people in this room will have a chance to make a change uh, that will benefit Peru and Latin America. Let me see if I can get this working. There we go. So what do I wish to do today? The first thing I want to do is try to pick some brains. And then I'll explain, it has a double sense. I want to seek for some people and at the same time try and make you think. So I'll share some information about that. Then this conference is about innovation. So I'll talk about some of the paradoxes that you find in innovation and that also apply to the education sector. Some of the questions I'll ask is, when do most innovations occur? What, who does the most innovations in the education sector? And what is the best innovation like? And then I'll talk about why is it so risky to take innovations in the education sector? We'll talk a little bit about the virtuous, the virtuous circle that exists in, edu in education. And finally, how we innovated in Equa. So let's start with the paradoxes. I made a, two questions. The first question is, when should you innovate? I put some alternatives. The first alternative is all the time. Whoever thinks that you should innovate all the time, you might be right. But who can innovate all the time? If you're very small, it is impossible. Actually, if you're very small, it is very possible because it's all you have to do when you begin. Once you get to a certain size, it will be unfeasible because of resources, because of time, and because a small group has to do all the exercises in a company. So never, that's obviously disregarded. And the answer, I'll tell you, the answer is D. When should you innovate? Well, you need, you need to innovate when you don't need to innovate. When you are actually with a product or a service that is a good product, that is when you do not need to innovate. But as a paradox, that is exactly when you should innovate. So let's go to the second question. When do you actually innovate? Well, you innovate when you need to innovate, when you're about to die, when you're desperate, or when you have nothing to lose. That is why the smallest companies, or when you're very small or you have a startup, well, that's where you innovate because you have nothing to lose. So there's a lot of paradoxes uh, related to innovation. What is the best innovation like? The definition of, inno of innovation means that you constantly are trying to change or improve uh, a product or service or whatever design. But as a paradox explains, once you tell someone to innovate and you reach a product that is good, you say, stop. Stay with this product. And you know what? Try and make this product last as long as possible. So, as a paradox, the best innovation is that one that doesn't change in a very long time. For example, a hammer. So you create a think tank, you create uh, an area for design innovation and so on. The true question you have to ask is what type of sector I'm in, what type of product I'm in, and what distance do I want my product or service to have in time. Now, why is it so difficult to innovate in the education sector? It's similar to the problems that you find of innovating in medicine, although in medicine it might be even easier. In medicine, you don't know if the operation went well until some time went by. And if you mix up an innovation in medicine with a, with a patient, well, the risk is that they die. But in education, if you innovate and it does not go well, the result, you will see it after five or four years. So it's very risky to innovate and that it doesn't go correctly because you're putting in risk the lives of students, their future, 
and the future of society. So it's very difficult to make uh, disruptive innovations in education. The cost is high, uh, and basically you have also restrictions from the market. Uh, you have restrictions from the governments. You have restrictions based on policies and even the same institutions. So it's very difficult to innovate in education, and we'll see what big innovations have been done in education along the years. It is the most traditional sector that we can find, uh, the education sector. So this is the education virtuous circle, and I'll explain it very briefly. When you have a university such as MIT or some of the ones we have here as Harvard and every single university that has a very high reputation, they are inside a virtuous circle. What does that mean? It means that when you have a high reputation, you attract the best professors. When you attract the best professors, that also attracts the best students. And for your information, the success uh, index of any student that finishes any career, of a graduate student, the best indicator of success is the student that went into the university. So that is why selection processes in universities are so important. So it attracts the best students. It also attracts the best funds. So the universities that have a high reputation, that have best professors, best students, also attract the best funds. So they have more money. This also attracts the best researchers. And when you have the best researchers, this involves uh, probably a good relationship also with companies. So it attracts the best companies and it creates this virtuous circle that is excellent. Now what is the problem? Why is this virtuous circle within a lock? The reason is very simple. Everyone wants to be in this virtuous circle. But it's a closed, it's a closed group, it's a closed club. Most of the universities, and I'll go back to the context that I know best, which is the Latin American context and the Peruvian context. In Latin America, you have, uh, I don't remember right now the, the amount of universities or uh, higher education institutions, but it's around the 2,000 higher education institutions. Mexico, for example, only has uh, 1,200, to put it in perspective. So what happens, for example, in Peru, we have around 150 or 140 universities. 10 are very good institutions. And then you have another 20 that are good institutions and that are doing the things well and that they're working towards improvement. The rest have serious trouble. And the, the problem is that they don't have the chance to enter this virtual circle. So it creates a closed circle uh, worldwide. So these are some innovations that we've seen uh, in higher education the last years. And the truth is that these innovations are four years uh, behind. It, what I mean is these are the innovations that were innovations four years ago. Today, they continue being innovations, and we have a few more. That means that we do not have too many innovations, or at least disruptive innovations. The countries that have done disruptive innovations are, for example, in basic education, which was a big risk, were Finland uh, and some other European countries. In higher education, I can tell you the story of a university that started very small. Once again, they innovated because they had to. They were about to die. They were in bankruptcy. They had no students for seven or eight careers. They said, what do we do? Either we innovate or we perish. And they said, we're gonna get all the students together in one class and put a professor that can teach them uh, how to research based on the, the different careers. So you had students from different careers in the same group. For any accreditation agency, and I'll explain right now what we are, it's impossible to be able to certify the quality of a program in that way. But those are the institutions that have to innovate because they have no other chance. The institutions that are really well, well, they'll try not to change what is working uh, well. So these are, I'm not gonna read all of them. Just for information, which is the first university that was created in Latin America? As Peruvians, yes. It is Universidad Mayor de San Marcos. So Peru 
has one of the has the oldest university in Latin America, and it should be a reason to be proud and also to seek how to continue improving education in our country. So what, what has happened along, especially the last years, with blended education, with online programs, and so on? The education sector and the education institutions are changing. They have been changing. So that's where we get, that's where we get born, or that's where we are created. Since institutions were changing, we needed to find a way to measure them differently. And that's where ECWA was created. So why and how did we innovate in ECWA? Well, the why is simple. We didn't agree. We disagreed with the way that other accreditation agencies in other countries, in the United States and Europe, were doing the measurements of quality. And the second uh, answer to how we did to innovate, well, it starts with we learned that others did not agree either. So we created a group. What is ECWA? Well, it's a nonprofit. It's a non-government institution. It's in the form of an association. And basically, it's an international accreditation agency. So I have to explain now what accreditation means, for those of you who do, who do not know. Accreditation means that an institution certifies a certain level of quality by measuring an institution and determines that it complies with the standards that that institution has provided. In our case, we are that agency. So before I continue with that definition, I, within that definition, I said quality. So I'll explain what it says there. I'm accredited, I'm the best, right? No. And the reason is because of the definition of quality. Quality has three characteristics. The first one is that it is a non-absolute value. So I'll explain that with a little example. This is a Ferrari. People that have a Ferrari will say, uh, it, it's more or less of good quality. Those of you who do not have a Ferrari will say, it's non, a non-quality car, it's because you're envious, but don't worry. The people that have two Ferraris will say, it's a really high quality car, because if they bought the second one, they have to actually uh, tell you that it was really good because they made a mistake twice, right? So that's a really good car. It's uh, around 250,000, depending on the model. At the side, uh, be, be, you can see a Kia Picanto. It fits about the same space as the Ferrari. Um, it uses less liters per gallon. Perfect. Um, it fits more people, actually. Five people can fit in the Kia Picanto. And it costs around $12,000. So what do we consider quality? The definition is that it is in non-absolute value. It means that it is related to the proposal of value that you provide to it. In education, it happens the same thing. You can have a really good school that costs $250,000, or a school that costs $2,000 per year. Once again, the definition of quality is according to the proposal uh, the institution has. It also has a non-finite non status. It means that it never ends. You can always improve. So therefore, on the definition that if I'm accredited, uh, if I'm accredited, I'm the best, it's not true. Being accredited means that you have started an improvement process. And what that certification means is that you're on your way to always becoming better. That is the definition. And finally, it has a perceived component. So how did we innovate in ECWA? Before, other accreditation agencies had a uh, rigorous uh, way of measuring. They would say there is a level, uh, a magical number for number of students per professor. Uh, it's a magical number. We never understood why. And we didn't agree with that. For us, it depends on several factors. They also measured programs that were meant to be professional and programs that were meant to be uh, towards research in the same way. We did not agree with that either. So we created a model that first of all, it was a stu stool set model. It meant that you would improve little by little, and you would say, first I'm one star, and my objective will be to be five star uh, institution. And we created three different profiles. So we said, if you're in a profile where your student at the end of his or her career will work at an institution, then his or her professors 
will have to be uh, in, the, in, the, in the sector where they're actually um, teaching, they will have to have experience, and so on. If you're in a research profile, then your professors have to have experience in research, have to be uh, publishing, and so on. That's a little bit of, of, of a really quick, it uh, takes about 20 minutes to explain it, but I think I did pretty good. And that's all for, for today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope I didn't pass the time. Thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you so much. So we have time for questions, one or two. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, someone? Someone to make a question? <laughs> Does anyone have any question for the presenter? Here. Hi, um, it's me again. Uh, hi. <laughs> so, uh, as far as accreditation goes, um, does a university or an institution have more than one accreditation, or is having an equa accreditation enough for it? Uh, and I had a second question, but maybe maybe you can answer that one first. Yes, yeah, I'll answer that one first. Um, it, it's very interesting. Uh, some of the best institutions, they don't have not even one accreditation. Uh, other institutions, for example, we accredited one in France, and they have uh, four accreditations. They have uh, AACSB, which is American, EFMD, which is European, uh, AMBA, which is for MBAs, and now they have EQUA, because they had an interest in Latin America. And we have members from all over the world, and we're pretty young. I mean, we have four years since we started, and our first accreditation was in 2016. And we've accredited in two years around 40 programs from six different uh, uh, countries or institutions. Um, so it's been really fast for us. So if you, I don't know if I answered the question, it depends yep, on the institution, yep. on, on what they want or feel is, is correct. That's great, thank you. Yeah, we have time for one more question. So yeah, there. Um, hi, uh, I was just wondering, um, what certifies EQUA to give accreditations to institutions? Like, if you're so new, how do you know that your model actually works? Great, Th thanks for the question. Um, well, there's two ways to uh, certify an accreditation agency, and we looked for both. Uh, the first way is to get people that are recognized worldwide. So what we did is, initially, our institution was created by another institution, or, well, was born thanks to another institution in Barcelona, which is CLADEA, which is the Latin American um, Association of Schools of Business. We accredit basically in business right now. So our first advisory board was from 10 different uh, representatives from 10 different countries, all gurus or all really recognized in the business uh, education world. So that was the first step. Our peer evaluators, because that's the way you accredit institutions. You have that uh, any accreditation agency sends peer evaluators to visit the institution. Well, our peer evaluators have been for, from um, graduates from Harvard, uh, from Universidad de Lovaina in Belgium, uh, the dean of the Tec de Monterrey, uh, the vice rector of institutions in Brazil, and so on. So we created a, a um, database, and if you will. We, First of all, we had 40, and now we have around 160 uh, peer evaluators. And the second thing we did was we registered, and we are now uh, one of the accreditation agencies registered in the Association of Worldwide Accreditation Agencies, which is called INCAE, or INCUAHE. Uh, we wanted also to get the recognition of CHIA, which is American, but they have well, one problem, that is that you have to have a office in the United States, you have to be American. So that's one of the things we're also striving to do. We already have a representative in Miami, and it's all very quick for us, so uh, that's the way in which you get recognized, uh, and uh, the way in which you also get recognized is by institutions that get accredited by you, and that provides reputation. Yeah, thanks. Well, okay, thanks, Eric, uh, and a round of applause for Eric. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks. <laughs>